Hi, welcome to the GRN, the Growth and Resilience Network, where every episode brings you targeted stories for your growth and resilience. Hi, I'm Steve Piscatelli, your host, coming to you live from my headquarters here in Atlantic Beach, Florida. The podcast you're about to uh, listen to is a bit different than the uh, previous episodes. Uh, late in September of this year, 2016, I had the uh, distinct pleasure and honor to sit down with uh, Dr. Frances Bartlett Kenny and discuss her life and why that, while that might not seem uh, very uh, unique in itself, this is a woman who is now in her 100th year of life and what a life it has been. Uh, she um, graciously allowed me into her home one afternoon and we sat down and um, listened that's what we did. I listened. I threw a few questions out to Dr. Kenny. Mostly I listened and continued to learn from her. I first got to know her when I enrolled as a, and reported to Jacksonville University's campus as a freshman way back in August of 1971. So uh, sit back and listen. This podcast uh, runs a little over an hour. It is well worth your time, even if you have to come back and listen to it uh, in a couple of sittings, because I tell you what, uh, the lessons are, in fact, timeless. So let's uh, join um, the conversation with Dr. Francis Bartlett Kenny. <laughs> and from uh, reading your, um, uh, your autobiography, you... Um, you grew up in a somewhat musical family, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. In fact, there's a book that's coming out now that uh, parenting, I wish I could repeat exactly what I said, but it's parenting across the country from, and the newspapers did this. And David, you, do you know Selig with the journal? Who's the publisher of the journal? He yeah. had He had asked me, and I said something like this, what, how valuable is parenting? Because I said I was so fortunate because my mother was a music, she was a librarian, musical librarian, but she had a beautiful color to her soprano. And my, my father was brilliant with words. I mean, he wrote and because we had a small town newspaper. Mm -hmm. And I, I just grew up in the newspaper office, small town newspaper, which is weekly. So everybody does everything. You learn the linotype, you learn, you know. You would learn everything. Now, I was the one that didn't have to learn everything because I was I was playing the piano. <laughs> <laughs> and you started piano lessons young. Two, well, I, I started no lessons because my mother played at two. Two. I started playing at two. Two. And then eventually from, from there, from Iowa, you're playing a few years in between, but you're World War II. And you're playing for the troops. Yes. But then the reason that I finally did, I won this, when I was 15, I won the state co piano contest over all the pianos. Oh, yeah. And that was the thing that sort of pushed me. And that's when the dress that I had was, I always, that's why I like red, because it was depression and there was no way we could buy a dress. And my folks had bought a beautiful, beautiful dress for me for confirmation. That was amazing because you didn't buy dresses in those days. I mean, mm -hmm. you couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. But this was a beautiful white chiffon dress. So my mother, when I, yeah, I, and I win all these contests, and I'm going to go to this final contest in piano, 15 years old. And mother said, we, we can't afford to buy. She said, but I'll tent. I'll tent the this beautiful white and she said you tell me what color you want and I said red so she tinted it and of course I won the contest over the state so ever since I said my dress was blessed <laughs> it was my confirmation dress. do you recall the year Dr. sure Kenny? sure I, that would have been 1933 1933 because mm -hmm. I was finished I finished I just had in fact I hadn't had my 16th birthday yet was 15. Yeah, that's mm. right. I told my wife when I was getting ready for this, I said, what I really need to do is just get out of the way and let, <laughs> <laughs> and, and let her talk because you've, 
you've got so many stories. You've got so many awards. I've got pages here of awards, and this is the short version <laughs> and what you have done in your life. I mean, from World War II hostess to um, getting the, you're, you were the first woman, American woman, to earn a doctorate and please pronounce the name correctly of the university. Johann Wolfgang Goethe Universität. So I could never have done that. And if I have it right, the degrees, um, the degree was a triple major, music, English literature, and philosophy. That's correct. Wow. And cum laude. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, oh, it took me forever. <laughs> <laughs> was it difficult, it, given the era that, this was, and you were the first woman to earn the doctorate from that university. Did you run into discrimination or were the, was it open arms, come on in, we're, you're here, you're like one of the rest of us? Uh, it was very difficult. It was difficult to get in because this was too soon after the war. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want me. They really did not. I kept trying to register and I wasn't accepted. I just kept after them until I was finally registered. But interestingly enough, the very first year, I was fortunate in getting two professors who were brilliant, and one was a, a Jewish professor who had escaped to the United States and came back. Mm. In fact, the, our president of the United States sent him back to open the, the universities again in Germany. So I was fortunate because he... he actually became one of the best known philosophers of that whole century and is known everywhere, uh, Max Horkheimer. And then, uh, fortunately then, I was, I was interested in Shakespeare. That was my major with English literature. And it just happened that he was very, very sympathetic. I did have the third professor who definitely was not, and that was in musicology. And he was not friendly. It was difficult. But then I signed up for a class with another professor who did tell me he did not want me in the class. Oh, so the first day, <laughs> welcome to class. <laughs> yes. The first day I left, the very first day I left. And then I did find out that they were letting him go the next year. So the rector told me, he said, just that's okay. He said, just wait, and he'll be gone by next year, and you can take that course next year. i got to ask you this, because this is a theme in all my podcasts, and, it, and as I was putting some notes together today for today, what, where did the resilience come from? I mean, uh, from, my, from your autobiography, it sounded like your parents were very instrumental in, there was a quote in there, um, that I fell in love with, that I, I believe it was your father. Um, and yes, life is a journey, not a guided tour. Right. <laughs> that was your dad. A a indeed. And he, uh, each of them, of course, mother was a librarian too, with a gorgeous color of cure voice. But the two of them, there was no question because the two of them led me in the right direction and, and let me be also very independent. But the the best part of all was their positive thinking. Yeah, and, and this was this is at the page one of your autobiography. My parents had always taught me to be independent, and I had a general optimism about my own capacity to live unhampered by doubt, hesitation, or fear. And that was due to them, strictly due to them. Wow, that's powerful. That's, and that had to have, um, what I'm hearing about this professor says, I don't even want you in my class. That had to be keeping you moving forward. That well, had it to did. be the fuel. And that doesn't mean I, I wasn't disturbed because I remember going home in tears that day to my husband. And then my husband was, of course, considerably older, had been, had, had led uh, a, a battalion actually, and then, and then six battalions in World War II. So he had been certainly endangered. Mm -hmm. And then he, he sat down with me and said, do you realize that we almost destroyed this city? It was 83%. Mm. Almost destroyed. 
So he said, everybody had lost somebody. I went back with a whole different, an entirely different perspective. I went back yeah. and I had had a, I had a sports car at that time. I, I never parked it. I parked it away about two or three blocks away. Everybody had, nobody had anything except drab clothes because mm. there were no stores open. All they had was sort of a khaki colored. So, and there were no women. These were all men. Mm -hmm. And so I just started wearing the same color. I, I, I dressed the way they did mm. and, and they accepted me. Out of respect, it yeah. sounds like mm -hmm. for them. That's powerful. And your husband, this is the first colonel. Correct. Right. Just briefly, he was um, a at the end of World War II when he's back in Germany, when you're going to the university. Right. What was his role? He, well, actually, he, of course, he had during the war commanded, as I said, a, a battalion. Mm -hmm. But he was in a, in a leadership role. Actually, he went back because, the, you see, the, we were still occupying. We were occupying at that time. So he, he was like a mayor. Mm. They, wow. Uh, like an American mayor. And uh, which gave all this social, which was a problem because we had all these social things to do, and which I loved. But on the other hand, that meant that I was doing social things until about nine thirty at night, <laughs> and then I was using, usually doing all my work between then and two in the morning. And my husband, and then I got up for Reveille too because he he always, no matter what what whatever he was commanding. He thought he should be up for reveille with the troops. So that meant I would get up. So well, when you're young, you can do these things. <laughs> you can know more. Than, and it was all in German. See, it was all in German. The, the, the courses. Everything. Everything was in German. So you're doing. And, and I wasn't particularly good in German at that time. My husband came <laughs> to the rescue. He hired a, a retired professor. And the professor was the man who came to dinner. <laughs> so you had what, what was like a tutor oh he was great yeah he was a tutor he was he helped huh? and i finally became actually you know it took me a while but i finally became very very good at it yeah but at yeah. the beginning uh you were surrounded by strong people and yes. these strong people had an impact on you from for discipline for grit persistence perseverance resilience and and optimism and optimism and you are one optimistic person see i believe this strongly i have a number of speeches i give on this i believe so strongly actually mayo i did a very interesting study back a few years not not long ago and they discovered that if you were a positive thinker and if you approach and this is not being a pollyanna this is it. if you're approaching things uh, in a way in which you you look one way that is positive as as something can happen mm -hmm. rather than negative you may live up to 10 years longer of course i'm already on the 10 years <laughs> <laughs> well you know that's <laughs> one of the questions i got cuz i did post on uh, on my facebook page i said uh, i got the chance to interview someone who is now living in her 100th year Right, you're 99 That's and correct. a quarter, but it is in your hundredth year. Correct, um, and you'll be. And I'm still working. And you're still working. I got so many questions. If you don't mind, can I go to these from Facebook? Because one of them, <laughs> one of them comes. You mentioned the 10 years, and somebody said, "Ask her, where do you see yourself in 10 years?" <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And given you, you, that would just be a drop in the bucket for what else you got left. So. At, at 99, at 100, are you looking uh, Are you looking to the future still? Now, you must remember that life is not about me. My whole theme is life is not about me. It's about others. That's correct. So you, you're not going to say, oh, 10 years from now, five years from now, or what did I do 20 years ago? No. My job right now is to help others. And what I can do that I'm capable of doing, uh, and goodness, people are helping me all the time. But that that is my theme. Mm -hmm. Life is not about me. Life is about others. And that, and if you look at my notes here, and she is not seeing this until I'm just showing it to her. If you could see what I have highlighted at the very top. Oh, you do. 
And it's that was the quote. And that's it. It's the quote you just said. That's exactly it. Yeah. That's true. That is it. That just and I hadn't seen me. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's um, you know you hadn't seen my notes on that, and that grabbed me because. Uh, We tend to live in a culture nowadays that seems to be the flip of that. Life's about me, not about others. But, But you know, one of the wonderful things I've had, the experience of working with young people, I think here's an example. For 10 years, while I was president, every Sunday, I went downtown and I played the piano and led singing for senior citizens. Okay, one year, I'm I'm right in the middle of the first year. Here came the Sigma Nu fraternity, the whole thing, all of them. They are volunteering. They said, we want to come and be with you every Sunday. And I said, now it's every holiday too, you know. Are you sure you want to do this? Yes, they did. I want you to know that for 10 years, the Sigma Nu fraternity was with me Mm. every Sunday every Sunday and every holiday. Now, this is for Jacksonville University. You mentioned president. So for the folks who might not know, uh, president of Jacksonville University from about 1978, 79 to to 89. Mm 10 years, right. But the interesting thing is, then after after the young boys had done this and they were with me, then here comes a a sorority. And the, the next year, so the sorority's with us. So we have this great, and they adopt the seniors. Mm. They're just marvelous. That was. And yes, I mean, the stu- so to me, when I hear people complain about young people today, and I say, please look again, because I've seen, I've seen this amazing, amazing response. Yeah, yeah. And when you were, um, you started at JU in 58 as a professor of humanities. Yeah, I, I was only going to stay six weeks. Yes. You were going to help them out. You find somebody, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, six weeks turned into uh, about Forever. four or five decades. Forever. Yeah, <laughs> Forever. And then you became the, the dean of fine arts? I, yes. Well, I didn't want to do that either. I, I <laughs> actually, I, I, I taught for, you see, actually the president, had read an article about my husband. That's how it started in the St. Augustine paper. And so consequently, he called and said, I understand that because there was one line that said his wife is Dr. Frances Kinney and she has received her doctorate. So it was Dr. Frank Johnson, who was always very alert, a great (laughs) president. And uh, he called and said, do you think you could help us for six weeks while we look for a professor who had apparently not appeared or was ill? I really don't know. And so I turned to my husband and I said, do you think I could do that? We lived out on the island, so that was that was difficult. He, My husband said, tell them you'll help them for six weeks. So I had the eight o'clock, actually eight o'clock classes at six twenty, and I'd be there at six twenty in the morning. Leave Saint Augustine. I had leave Saint Augustine. I'd leave the island and go over the mm-hmm. bridge, and then go up in my little, my little Volkswagen, which was not air conditioned. <laughs> my husband always said, "My wife isn't very smart because when she got her doctorate, I offered." Well, of course, we were in Germany at the time, yeah. and she could have anything she wanted, and then she chose that little that little bug and uh, and and I went back and forth in that and that's when the the motor was in the back yeah, you know and it was right. yeah so but I, I enjoyed every minute of it and then was it three years later became the dean three years later they asked me um would I stay a little bit and I said no I wouldn't uh, because we were going to move my brother was in California and we'd been overseas for for almost eight years and I want. I just wanted to go spend some time with with my brother, mm. and so they said, "Would you stay?" And I said, "No." And my husband was retiring at the time, so it was it was perfect for us to go to California. So I said, "But I'll tell you what I will do. You've got all this talent. Uh, there's so much music talent, and uh, already organized." And I said, "We should have a College of Fine Arts." I will plan one for you, according to Drake University, where I had attended. And I, and then, the, but then you're going to have to find a dean. 
And so I made a, I made a, a, a very detailed plan for a college of fine arts and uh, gave it to them. And then about a, a month later, they all come to me and they say, well, we can't, we don't know who, we, we don't, we're, we're, how are we going to find a dean? And I said, well, that's easy. I'll help you find a dean. They said, well, why don't you just help us while you help us find a dean? So I said, you mean for a year? So I talked to my husband and he said, well, tell him that's okay. In the meantime, his best friend was J.E. Davis and mm -hmm. he was fishing on, he was fishing and having a good time. And this is of the Win dixie Yes, Davises. correct. Yes. And, uh, and a wonderful man and they were great pals. So I thought, okay, for a year, I'll do it. So I did it for a year. <laughs> and then it was another year. And then it was another year. <laughs> and when I came to JU as a freshman in 1971, you were still doing it at that point. That's right. And that's right. You were. <laughs> and now you go on campus and there are buildings with your name on it. It's pretty powerful. Well, I shouldn't, you know, I don't believe in that anyway, but they were very gracious when they did that because I, I was raised, I remember my mother saying when I was little, she said, Oh, no. Fools' names and fools' faces are seen around in public places. And the interesting thing is they built this beautiful library in my hometown, and her name is across the Is that top right? Of Bertha Bartlett Public Library. <laughs> well, and you've got a number of buildings. Yes. Around the country, I think. I think five or six. Yeah. yeah. All right. Question from the Facebook post. Um what one thing in your life has happened that as a child you never thought or dreamed that would be possible? So that could either be for something that happened to Francis Bartlett Kenny or maybe in in our world as it is. Because somebody else asked about what invention or development um, or innovation did you find the most awe-inspiring? So those two questions kind of go together. For For me... It probably was when I won that piano contest in Des Moines over all the pianists. Hmm. Because I never really thought that I was, I mean, I never dreamed. I, I was pretty sure that I didn't want to make a life out as a concert pianist. But uh, because I like to sing, too. And actually, I like to sing with dance bands. Really? Oh yes. They was that your favorite kind of music? No, no, no. Well, I liked all music. I like I like all kinds of music. music. Okay. Yeah. No, I was classically trained, but but I improvise too. See, so so I um, I still do that. I mean, I do my own music. <laughs> <laughs> Have you written? Have you I've written some. Mm -hmm. Composed some. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and but that but that's not the area that I like the most. No, it's the performing. You love the performing. Uh, yes. I, I like to just sit down at the piano and I, I would do this at parties and, and lead. Um, but I love teaching music. And I did. In fact, I, that's what I was teaching at first was uh, I usually get in on English literature. They'd put that with the music. But I, I loved. And then I played all the brass instruments, too. So mm. I played all the brass instruments. And so I played in the bands. And the marching bands, and and uh, I just had fun. With yeah, all of it. yeah. Do you still play your piano? Oh, every day. Every day. Mm -hmm. The piano was made for me. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, my uh, husband's family lived in Mountain Lakes, New Jersey, and the, they were neighbors with the Steinways, the famous Steinway family. Of course, that started in Germany, but this was the as the Americans came here. And they make the Steinway piano in three different places, mm. and uh, and so when we were going, we had already been in China and we were evacuated from there, and then we'd been in, we'd been in Japan for three years, and we'd been in Germany for four years. We were going to go to Germany for four years, and then my husband said, "We bought a piano in each case, and we would leave the piano in wherever we were." Mm -hmm. And he said, "You need something really beautiful," and so. He spoke to the Steinways, and the, and they suggested we have it done since we were going to Germany. That that's where it really started in the beginning. Mm. And so I had a chance to pick out the wood. Uh, they came and measured my strength of my fingers. Wow! And uh, 
Yes, that's all because they were neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this, the piano that we just took a photo by. It's a concert piano. Mm -hmm. And it was built, made, constructed, designed mm -hmm. with you in mind, with your finger strength in yes. mind they in had, Germany. They did two of those, one wow. for Roger Williams, the great pianist, wow. and one for me. And I picked out the wood even. Mm. And it took, it was just like a baby. It took nine months. <laughs> And when was that complete? When, oh, when did it? It looks like new. You it can, does. Yeah, it, it looks does. absolutely like new. That was when, when we were in Germany, so that would have been in the late 50s. Wow. Late 50s. Yeah. Gee. <laughs> and it's been moved around and moved around, and it's still, it's amazing. It, it, is, it is beautiful. It really is. Is there any, this was again from uh, questions that were submitted to me, is there any one major event during your lifeline? lifetime that you feel has changed the course of our nation for better or worse? Actually, there, there are, and perhaps I learned quite a bit from this. Um, I think probably being evacuated from China I, I looked at things a bit differently. I happened to be in Nanking because when we were, we were in the northern part of China at Hankow, and um, I kept seeing around me, I had seen people dying. And I can still remember, this was in Shanghai, I can remember seeing this mother with three little children in a, in a, a doorway she was living in the doorway and we were not allowed we were not allowed to do to give or to in any way to help this was offensive to the Chinese if we did and uh, I became very very sensitive I grew up during the depression so I I really knew I knew I'd gone through this because I went hungry a couple of times in college I did not, I didn't want my parents to, to know and have the responsibility, but that was a time when nobody had anything, absolutely nobody. So I'm watching this in China and I became very sensitive to others' thoughts, others' beliefs and how we handle them. Hmm. And I became I really, of course, I already had been, I was studying in the different areas. So each country, I would try to learn as much as I could about the philosophy because that was one of my majors. So I, I was interested, but then when I had to escape because I had gone into Nanking, uh, to get a B12 shot and see if they could help me because I became anemic. I know it's hard to imagine I was anemic, but I was anemic. <laughs> and so, uh, I left my, I left my, I flew for my husband and then he was, he was going to, uh, I was to come back in two days and have all these things done. While I'm there, the U.S. government says, um, everyone in China, all the Americans will be sent back to the United States immediately. I'm in Nanking. My, 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 my bridegroom is in uh, Hankow, and I'm determined I'm going to get back to him. And he's determined I will get back to him. But there I am. And I had to, and the communists had already fall, had come up to the city so that there was no way to go on the roads. And I found my way. I found my way. And I think I've found my way in my life many times, just, just thinking about that situation. Because I wanted, I was determined to get back to Hancock. I even know that I would get back to Hancock would mean I'd, be turned around to be evacuated, but I would be with him. Hmm. And so I was determined. So I, I got a hold of a driver I had had in a little curry that, that day. And at that night it was because this the announcement came and the Americans were to be evacuated immediately. And so I got a hold of him and I said, if I find a way to fly back to, to, Hancock, would you would you be willing 
to pick me up? And he said, yes, he would. We managed to get through the Chinese, even though I didn't speak. I spoke a little Chinese, but not very much, believe me. So actually, it's probably the most thrilling time because I can still remember um, I had to find a way to get, because you couldn't go on the roads. Hmm. I had to get back to my husband. I had met a pilot on the ship when we went over. And I remembered he handed me his card and he was stationed in Nanking. He had said, if you ever get to Nanking, call me. I called him and I said, I was just lucky to get him. He said, I'm going into Hankow tomorrow to evacuate. He said, you'll just be evacuated. And I said, well, that's okay. I'll be with my husband. He said, if you can be here at the airport at 5 o'clock in the morning, I will fly you to Hankow. I will let your husband know that you are coming. But he said, I'm just going to turn around. You'll be coming back the next day. I said, that's okay. I'll be with my husband. So that night, we had no power. All the power was gone. I st- but I did. I got there. And, of course, my husband was so... He said, you never should have come back. It's so dangerous. You should never... And I said, I know, but I'm with you. It doesn't make any difference. So we escaped, and then we we escaped to Shanghai. Then he was told that he would be one of 10 officers that would stay to try to get the equipment out of China. So that I was put on a ship down on the E-deck. I had no idea where I was going, absolutely no idea. We started out on the ship. There were... All, all nationalities, all nationalities, down on the E-deck. And I found myself landing in Yokohama. And they told me to get off in Yokohama. Hmm. They said, your husband's going to be here eventually. So I go, to, I go out in Yokohama, and suddenly it's a whole different world. It's peaceful. It's friendly even even the, these were had been our enemies but they were friendly and general macarthur was in charge and he had discipline these these people were behaving and they were gracious and nice it was a whole new world to me and even though i waited and waited and waited for my husband to come and i slept on a mattress that that was on a, a boxes that were beer boxes i think and uh, I wasn't the only one. There, the other evacuees were, too. Oh, yes. It was a great experience. How long were you married at that point? Oh, oh just seven or eight months. Oh. No, oh, I yeah. was a bride. You were. It was newlywed time. Yeah. Heck That's of why a honeymoon. I, I wasn't going to leave him. <laughs> <laughs> Heck of a honeymoon. Um, someone wanted to know, what is your opinion on how society where humanity can achieve peace and tranquility in our lifetime. Oh, my. Now that, would that we could. You know, I see I see now the difficulties now. But again, I, I will tell you that I, I think that we meet challenges as we do now. We have to meet them. Are we going to meet them? That's a good question. And I think that the the fact really that we the, the actually that we have young people that are are really now looking at the situation, and I like that. I think it's great. We're going to have to do that. Um, would that there would be a way to be a cure? Do you see us going through the same thing? I mean, albeit different names, different personalities, different years. Are we going through the same crises again that you live through? Is this you? Do you see any similarities, any continuity with some of the issues that we uh, are facing? I do see some similarities, but I also see something that's frightening to me. What's that? Because, and that is this lack of concern for life, and it's it seems to be. Um, cheapened in a way, if I can use that expression. Um, because that that is a big difference. That is a big difference. 
But isn't it interesting that when you see difficulties in a community, how there seem to be a, a way of people coming together. So I'm looking for that. I'm looking for that now. Do you see, um, you live through a, a world war. I mean, and you literally live well, through yes, it. Well, yes, and yeah. through the Korean War. And the Korean War. Yes. And, then the, and Viet the Vietnam War. War. Right. And With then, a husband who was active, you know. At, yes. On, on a world stage, um, do you have hope? Are you hopeful? Oh, well, you. I'm a positive thinker. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must say that I have to push a little bit, but I have to push a little bit. But, but I, I do feel when I see... Uh, I guess because I work with young people and I see the hope in young people. I really love the energy. Okay, some days they don't agree. I don't want everybody to agree with me. If everybody agreed with me, there's something wrong. Mm. I know that. Right, right. And you seem to have a, an unfaltering faith in the young generation. Oh, I do. I do. And, and that's been ever since I've known you. Yes, um, you, you just, you don't give up. You don't no. look at them and say, oh my gosh, it was so much better 10 years ago, no. 20 years ago. No, no. They may be that way when they come to me, but they're not going to leave that way. And that, <laughs> that is, in fact, I, I, yesterday, even I had nine of my gra former graduates and today I've had a group. There and, was one when I walked in the door. That's right. <laughs> so, no, um, and they know, and they're open, and they know they can confide in me, and and you know, and I do a lot of, I I do do a lot of, of, uh, perhaps, with with um, graduates who have have been out in the world a little bit and come mm -hmm. back with with feelings, different feelings, and they like to express themselves. And uh, yesterday, I had the mother, the the daughter of a mother I, I, that I had. In class, which was interesting, uh, the guard at the gate had called me and said there was a woman that stopped by here this morning and said, "Does does Doctor Kenny live here?" And he said, "Yes, she does. Would you like me to call her?" And she said, "No, she doesn't know me, but she had my mother as a student, and all I would like to know is, do I look like my mother? Because her mother had passed away oh, many, wow. many, many, many wow. decades ago." She said, all I wanted to know was, do I look like my mother? So I saw her yesterday. <laughs> this, I'm, I'm amazed when you, the, the lives that have you've touched. 16,000. 16,000? 16,000 here. Students mm -hmm. you're talking? Correct, graduates. Graduate, mm -hmm. wow. But these are ones that I have known, not, not just passing them a, yep, so right these are giving them not. a yeah i hear you yeah and i remember where they sat in my classes and when you were teaching did you um thinking back to the the uh, professor in germany who's basically said i don't want you here I, I, did that have an impact on you as a professor as a teacher and how you would then interact with your students. No, because I knew, I started to teach when I was 18, you know. And That's right, you did. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, no, I knew. I love to teach, I, and I love kids. Mm -hmm. And so I must say that when I was teaching music, see, I was teaching from first grade to 12th grade. I actually lost my voice eventually because... I was trying to see you know, those poor boys when they're in eighth grade and ninth grade and they're <laughs> they're losing they're changing their voices yeah. and I was trying to sing their parts with them and and so on, but uh, I I loved all ages I really did I I was fun with all of them. Best decision that Francis Bartlett Kinney has made. That's one I can make. When I signed up for my first teaching job, I was 18, and that was to teach at a small town. It was a big school. It was a consolidated school, but it was a small town in Iowa. And uh, it was from first to 12th grade, and it was music, and then I think I was to have a homeroom, too. 
Um, at the same time, I get a telegram from Hollywood. And I knew the string bass player in the Freddie Martin Orchestra, which is at the Coconut Grove each night in Hollywood. He had heard me sing because I, 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 I did this in college to earn my way through college. I'd play the piano, but I'd also sing with the dance bands. Mm -hmm. In those days, they called them the girl singers. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they were. And so I decided that was fun. I decided that maybe that's what I'd like to do is be a girl singer. <laughs> I could be the backup for the piano and be a girl singer. This tell that I now signed my contract. Now I had signed my contract for teaching. Yes, correct. I was I was just having my 18th birthday, and I was signing up. So I get this message, and it offers me a contract: Hollywood, Coconut Grove every night. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd be backup pianist, but I'd be the girl singer. What you were hoping for. Yeah, yeah. sure. So I, I went, I kept thinking, what am I going to do? I've already signed the contract and I want to do that, but I also would, this would be glamorous. You know, I, it would be, I knew that it wouldn't last very long. I mean, probably last five or maybe 10 years at the most. So I went to my folks because they were always, they were letting me be very independent. And uh, and they taught me to be that way. But I did go to them because I respected them so much. And I, I went to them and I said, I'm really trying to decide what to do. I've already signed that contract. And here I have this opportunity. Um, and it's a national because they, it's heard all over the country every night. Huh. And that's how I... and. It's the Freddie Martin Orchestra, and I'll be the girl singer. And uh, and mother's, mother looked at me, and she said, well, didn't you say you signed the contract? <laughs> and when she said this, you know, it hit me. I knew, yes, yeah, uh -huh. no. And I've never been sorry. That was the best decision. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it tied into that. And then I want to get to the Hollywood thing, because you brought that up, and there's some interesting connections here. Um, a little different. I mean, that's, that's an important decision that just paved the rest of your life. Really? Would you, when you look back at your career, what would you say was your most memorable accomplishment? Excuse me, most meaningful. Let's make it most meaningful accomplishment in your career. And that's a storied career. But see, I don't really look at, I don't think about accomplishments with me. I, I'm more concerned. I think more about people. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a joy for me. It, it, it's still a joy for me when when they just today, like today. I mean, that that's to me, it means a great deal. I, I don't think of that as an accomplishment. I think of it more as uh, uh, what I'm made my life to be. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, you know, if you want to call it, I don't know. I, I'm not sure I'd call it an accomplishment, though. Mm. But I think more that it's a joy, a joy in my life. Yeah. And the joy you brought to others. I'm looking at the uh, autobiography here. Iowa Girl, the president wears a skirt. And, and I didn't make that up. That was, <laughs> Yeah, that was Frank Pace in Hollywood. Is that right? He, he, he came up with it. Yeah, and then the the second book that came out, the second edition came out. I had had to ask him, I can't. What can I call that? And he said, Oh, you can call that the final final. <laughs> <laughs> and he was one of your students. Well, or one of the he the wasn't JU. in my class, but but he was at JU and in, in yes, and very very talented. Oh mm. my goodness, he's so talented. Yeah. He does the Walt Disney movies. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Jay Thomas was another one. And Jay was yeah. another one. Oh, yes. Great. Wonderful sense of humor. Oh. Well, looking at the foreword, and the foreword is always fun to look at in a book. And yeah, you, I mean, you want to talk about a trifecta. You have <laughs> right here, I'm looking at this Bob Hope, <laughs> Charlton Heston, mm -hmm. and Winston Churchill. Yes. 
Uh, that is phenomenal. And the three of them all offered to do it. I didn't even ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were wonderful, really. And, of course, I'd known Bob because I got to know Bob in uh, in Tokyo. Because then, then see, when I, when I was evacuated there, then eventually I got on General MacArthur's staff. Now, my husband was on General MacArthur's staff. staff. But eventually I did become... And I had I was in charge of the entertainment for the Far East Command, so I had the islands and the different places. So when Bob Hope came uh, to entertain, uh, I I got to know him then. Mm. And and I remember I was at this event that you orchestrated. I believe the year was nineteen seventy two. Mm -hmm. I believe the month was April. Correct. Correct. You know what I'm talking about. I know. I do. You know and. Um, I, I was finishing up my freshman year, and I was ready to go back home for the summer. And all of a sudden, I hear Bob Hope and Jack Benny are going to be on campus. The first time they ever got together. The only time they ever got together. Talk a little bit about that. Well, it took me seven years, but I finally got them. <laughs> it really did. As a matter of fact, a book came out in New York. It's interesting because this, this man was writing a book about Things that change your life is something that you do. Mm -hmm. And he had, he had there had been a, a, actually the New York Times actually wrote a story about Bob Hope and Jack Benny being here. And so he called me and wanted to know, uh, would I please write up my, for a, a, one chapter in the book? And I said, no, I don't have time to do that right now. And so then he came back about a month later and he said, uh, are you sure you won't do this? He said, well, if you won't do it, will you let me do it? Well, no, I wasn't going to let him do it. <laughs> so I did it. And and it was interesting because um, Muhammad Ali had a chapter right beside mine. And so one night, and I did, I wrote about Bob Hope and Jack Benny, how difficult it was and how I finally made it. But there was a, um, it was very interesting. They entertained that, the author and and then the publishing company that published that book uh, entertained each of us who, who had a chapter. I remember the governor of my state in Iowa had a chapter in there, I remember. So each one of us was invited, and they had a dinner for us at the in New York. And uh, I, I happened to sit by Muhammad Ali, hmm. and um, I never knew he was a magician. And I can, I can still remember that night at this banquet, because I was wearing a, a a suit that had a pocket up on the left on the left breast, and he was I was sitting on his right, and so he kept looking at this handkerchief. It was a pretty silk handkerchief that I'd brought back from the Far East, and he said, uh, "Do you mind if I look at your handkerchief?" And I said, "No, I'd be happy to have you look at my handkerchief." So. I can't remember if he took it out or if I took it out. But anyway, so in the meantime, somebody came up to speak to me. And so uh, I, in, a, in about a, no, no more than a minute, uh, I, I turned to him and he said, would you like your handkerchief back? And I said, I thought this was sort of strange. And I said, oh, yes, I really would. So he put his finger in his sleeve of his coat, pulled out. One, two, three, <laughs> four, all sick handkerchiefs, silk, silk yeah. handkerchiefs in different colors. And here was my handkerchief right in the middle of it, and tied to tied to two others. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> he was a magician. And I never yeah. knew. When he passed away recently, you know, I, I thought, my goodness, he had talents that, that other people didn't know. Right, right. Uh, when... Um... When Bob Hope was here and Jack Benny, um, is there anything about the visit that you, I mean, the, it was monumental that they were here. And I did have Bob here uh, four or five times. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That particular visit, you finally get them here seven mm -hmm. years in the making. They're here. And it was for a JU graduation, if I recall. Was I, I made a requirement. Anybody that I did a year of celebrities, and I had a number of different celebrities. But I made a requirement. I didn't pay anybody anything. Nobody got paid. 
So I w- that's another reason I had to work over <laughs> some years in order to, <laughs> to get them to come. But one of the things I would always say that it, if, you, if you're gracious enough and nice enough to come, then I would really appreciate it if you would spend a, at least a day with the students mm-hmm. and a day downtown. So they, and they did this. They all did it. They did. Mm-hmm. That's respect the head for you as well. Well, I just felt that it was so important for students to have, because if you have, if you have a VIP that's coming perhaps to get an honorary doctorate or to perform or whatever, uh, for them, it's terribly important for, to realize how important they are Mm -hmm. to the audience. Sure. Exactly. And, uh, and they, every, I never had anybody turn me down. They, they all did it. What Charlton Heston was one of the most ex- he was one of the most exciting ones because, well, they all were exciting. That I'll never forget. We had a, a program when he came, and we we had the students all go to the gym, and so Charlton Heston was speaking, and uh, I, to this day I remember. And he remembered it too, because I'd see him many times afterwards. And he, this was a, this was a glorious moment, because he was speaking and and he was wearing a robe. We had given him an honorary doctorate too, and he was wearing this robe, and he was finishing up his. And the and of course the youngsters were packed into the gym, just packed everywhere, and um, I still remember. So he was doing. He was he was philosophizing for one thing and then he closed it with in the from the tempest with the final speech in the tempest Mm. and of shakespeare and he put his arms up and oh my goodness because everybody thinks of him as moses in the in the movie (laughs) he put his arms up high and he's speaking and then he says this this farewell speech it was incredible Mm. And there was about 30 seconds afterwards. And I kept thinking, oh, what's the response going to be? I was afraid that nobody applaud or whatever. It was about 30 seconds, dead silence. And then suddenly they went wild. The students were whistling and stomping their feet. And it was so thrilling. He never forgot that. Up until the time, not long before he died, he even mentioned to me, he never forgot that moment. Wow. Powerful. Somebody um, had submitted this and asked me to ask you. said, I'd be curious about her faith or faith traditions and whether they had sustaining value in her life. Oh, indeed. I have a strong faith. Oh, my goodness. I could never have made it without a strong faith. Strong faith, Disciplined parents, loving parents. Yes, but I'm also very ecumenical. Mm-hmm. I'm very ecumenical. Having lived, having lived eight, almost eight years overseas in China, Japan, and Germany, one can one better be ecumenical. And that has sustained you throughout your life. Always, always. But my parents were that way. See, my parents were. Mm-hmm. And if you would just briefly for folks listening, when you say you were and have been and still are ecumenical, just briefly explain. Well, if, if I admire people who have one way of, of thinking. This is That's fine, and that's their privilege, and they want to do it. I try to be understanding of other faiths. Mm-hmm. I do believe there's one God, and so consequently there may be varying ways, uh, and that's the, that's the right of that person. Uh, but I I believe this strongly, and having been raised where where I actually had the experience of of going to um, going to church and going to Sunday school, I do have one funny moment though that well t- I will tell you that when I was uh, just five years old, uh, my parents this was Christmas Eve and I was to sing and do a little. Um, I was to do a little saying in the uh, church for that particular evening. And the Sunday school people were doing a lot of the, the program. 
And my parents, my mother had, she sewed beautifully. And I'm sure we couldn't have afforded to buy this dress. But my mother made me this gorgeous peach silk dress with layers of lace all up and down. I was five years old. This gorgeous lace. It really was, it was, it was amazing. At the same time, that was the dress I was to wear when I was reciting and singing. And so at the front of the church. And so it just happened. They gave me my Christmas Eve present just before we left to go to the church. It happened that it was sort of a Mackinac in those days, which is the, that's one of the rough jackets. Uh, and it was bright orange and heavy plaid wool, uh, great for snow. And, and I love to skate and go down the, the hills in, the, in, the, in my sled. So here it was. So I'm to go down in the front row and they take me down to the front row and I have the coat on over my gorgeous dress. This, this horrible looking Mackinac. And so they leave me there with the teacher. And so it's getting ready for me to do my singing and my my little entrance, etc. And I refused to take off the jacket because it was my gift. And it was <laughs> and there I am and my mother, who had spent all this time doing this lace and it was so beautiful. And I get up in this rough <laughs> like a little men's jacket and get up in front of the church. I never forgot it. <laughs> and nobody else forgot no. it either. <laughs> <laughs> Your mom, probably. Well, the whole audience, you know. I mean, oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, listen, you have been gracious to spend this time with us. Let's leave in um, both of us being teachers. We always love to give a little bit of homework so our folks can, our students would be able to apply what we've been talking about. So if there was a call to action to people listening to you, and it's not about you. Thank you, know, you. It's about others. However, you have a hundred years out there of great <laughs> experiences that um, those of us listening don't have. Um, if, you, if when it comes to resiliency, when it comes to grit, when it comes to moving forward in in one's life and doing something for one society, one's community. What's the charge you would give to people? What's the, and I, I hesitate to even say advice, but what's the charge? You say, listen, as you move forward with the rest of the days you have in your life, here's what I would suggest you consider. What would you suggest they consider? What would you suggest they do so that they can live a life of resilience like you have and also help others do the same. It's interesting that you bring up that because I knew you as a teacher. I knew you were adored by your students. I also know that you're highly creative. You're very, very creative. Uh, you have the ability really to capture. I can see why students would feel that way with you. You have that ability. Uh, I like your openness. I like your freedom. I like the fact that you think this way. And that's one reason I think your students responded mm. the way they did with you. This is a great quality. You're asking me, I probably would ask you because the same thing, because I see in you also the fact that you, you really aren't, you aren't thinking about you. You're thinking about others, and that's exact. Even with what you're doing now, even what you're planning to do, mm -hmm. is you're not thinking about yourself. I do think that for all of us, that, and obviously we have to be concerned about ourselves. I, I have a little tendency leaning away from that. And it comes back to that quote that you had said toward the beginning of this um, particular podcast, which was, life isn't about me, it's about others. Right. And you keep on coming back. I mean, you do. You keep. You live that. But you, so do you. Yeah. Well, so I hope you. so. I hope so. I don't know if I have have reached. Uh, I mean, this is a uh, this is the fabric. And you're right. That is something as a teacher, 
in the classroom that you always want your students to, to shine. Um, and what I've, uh, I've told folks before, and um, I've had a very dear friend who's a musician and a great entertainer share the same th thought, different words, mm -hmm. but he says it's never, a, this was this performer speaking, he said, it's never about me. It's always about the yeah. audience. And um, I attempt to remember that anytime I'm in front of a, an audience of, you know, a thousand or one, and it's, it's about that person in front of you. It's and, true. Yeah, it, it is. And you're, you are just the joy to be with it. It's amazing. Um, I never would have thought in 1971 that I would be here 45 years later, <laughs> sitting in your den, <laughs> having this conversation. <laughs> this is phenomenal. Uh, it, it would be great. I don't know. I, like I said, I've overstayed my welcome today. Never, um, never, never. I would love to hear you play piano. I'll play it for you. Yeah, I sure, would I'll love play to. For you. Yeah, yeah. I would love uh, to. And as a matter of fact, um, I love to do, I played for Duke Ellington. Duke, you know, I had Duke Ellington. Uh, Duke Ellington. One of my favorite numbers is was my husband's favorite number, and it was by Duke Ellington. So I had the Duke come, and he he did a concert. What was the, the number? Duke. It, well, I'll play it for you, okay. and then you'll see. Okay. He he actually uh, he the last concert he gave before he died was right here. Right here. In Jacksonville. In Jacksonville. J.U. Wow. And he did it at a reduced, oh my goodness, I just think, because we didn't, I didn't have the money to pay him. And uh, so I'd managed to cook up some, I was trying to get him for a long time. And uh, then I did get him for the symphony, because I was handling the programs for the symphony at the time. So I had him do a number for the symphony. Mm -hmm. And he did, which he did. The, then symphony went to Washington and New York. We, we played it there. And, but then I got to know his son, who since has died, who played tr lead trumpet in it. And he brought the whole band, the whole band was here. Wow. And it was incredible. And it just happened because I, I've always had students work in the office. Now they don't do that anymore, but I always had students because I could hear things that they would tell me <laughs> and I can still remember these two boys came into me and they said oh Dr. Kenny you need to know they're gonna they're gonna streak tonight <laughs> and I said um, oh Duke Ellington's here well that's good I said that's fine I mean they'll have an opportunity to hear Duke Ellington and I'm sure we'll be fine that's all I said I never objected or anything I didn't say anything so anyway I kept wondering, you know, <laughs> but when I agree, you know, well, okay, it's okay. Yeah. yeah. And was there a streaking that nope. happened? No, 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 no. They came to the concert. <laughs> Fully clothed. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, so that night, that night, uh, the bus was, go well, they were going to go to Tampa to play. Only he didn't go and they were, th they weren't through until 11. And uh, they were still going to drive to Tampa. And um, so he, his nephew, who also played in, in the band, uh, was driving. And he so he was driving him, so he didn't go on the bus. And I went, I went out to the car when they got in. And uh, he reached out and hugged me and kissed me. And, and, and then he, di he died. That was very, very yeah, soon after that. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I never, because I never had enough money compared yeah. to what they had. Sure. Then his son invited, uh, my husband's living then, so my he invited us up to New York to hear one of their big concerts, which we, and we did go mm. up. Wow. Uh -huh. But I'll play for you. In okay. A, yeah, Will I be able to record that? Mode. Would that be okay? Oh, you probably shouldn't record. It's not that good. <laughs> If you want to record a little bit of it, okay, you know, we'll recover a little bit of it. Yeah. All right. I this gotta... has been absolutely wonderful. I'm going to close it off right now. All right. You're going to close okay. it off right, right now. Okay. Okay.